Hello, welcome once again to Leto's Law. I'm Steve Leto. A couple points of uh, interest. First of all, I've got to tell you, uh, a, a top row behind me, the microphones, number one, eight, and nine from your left to right were just donated to me by a viewer. Uh, thanks a lot, Greg, for those. They add uh, wondrous things to the collection. And second of all, today's topic comes to us from Pete, who asked me, Steve, if I've got a judgment against somebody, how do I collect it? And uh, he indicated that he might have a reason for asking that question. I suspect that he or someone he knows has a judgment which they would like to collect. And I get asked this question a lot because if you want to, you know, sue somebody and get your money, they owe you money for some reason. Uh, suing them and winning is only the first step. Now, the next step is where you try to collect the money based on the judgment. But it can be difficult. It might not be difficult. It depends what kind of defendant you're dealing with. So, for instance, General Motors, Ford, or Chrysler, who I sue all the time on Lemon Law claims, pay me, okay? <laughs> In fact, most of my cases settle so long before I get a judgment, it's not even an issue, okay? But there are occasions where you get a judgment against somebody. It's a piece of paper from the court that says, yes, this person owes you money, and the court will enforce this debt if need be. And that's the important thing to remember is the judgment actually comes with the force of the court's behind it. So... Like I said, we're not going to talk about how, how to get the judgment. I've talked about that before in different contexts. But once you've got the judgment, you've got a piece of paper from the court that says judgment. It's in your favor. It's against somebody else. And, and I've mentioned before also that, that some of the most disappointing things in my career were I got judgments, judgments against uncollectible entities. And by entities, I mean I sued a corporation. The corporation went bankrupt. And the corporation bankruptcy got the judgment discharged so my clients got nothing. I've also had it happen before where my clients got something, but they got, you know, 50 cents on the dollar instead of a dollar on the dollar. So first thing you need to remember is the moment you get a judgment, okay, assuming it's collectible, the, the interest meter is running on it. So if you get a judgment against somebody and it takes a while for you to collect it, you're going to get, you're going to get, you know, post judgment interest on that judgment. So if they owe you $10,000 and it takes them a couple of years to pay you, you're going to get a substantial amount of interest if in fact you get them to pay everything. But you have to, I'm not going to get into the math here, but you actually have to calculate this out and figure out what the interest is at any given point in time. So you do get to collect the full amount of your judgment plus interest. So there are now, the obvious question arises, well, how do you get someone to pay you? Okay. And once in a while, someone will chime in on one of my videos and go, well, the key here is that you simply make yourself judgment proof as as if there's some like f switch you can flip and make yourself judgment proof and it is true that some people are very very difficult to collect from but it's almost impossible in our day and age to become judgment proof so the first thing you gotta remember is judgments actually last for 10 years uh if it's gotten in small claims court it might be a little shorter but but quite often a typical judgment is good for 10 years and the other thing is to remember that at the end of the 10 years you can go into court and get it renewed so in theory, if you've got a judgment against an individual, you can chase them for 20 years if you want to, you know, so leave it hanging out there. Um, most people, by the way, when they get a judgment against them, if they think about it, they realize, oh, wait a second, this judgment's going to destroy my credit. So it's in their best interest to pay it off. But let's assume that you got a judgment against somebody, it's an individual, and they haven't gone bankrupt, and they just simply don't want to pay. What can you do? So believe it or not, there's a couple things you can do with the court, where the court will help you try to collect the money that someone owes you. So the first thing you can do is you can, you can drag the, 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 the person who owes you the money into court for a, a, an examination, okay? And, and by examination, I mean you're going to get to ask them the questions under oath, okay? And so uh, there's, there's a form for that. It's, it's, a, it's actually a subpoena. And, and you simply check the boxes on it that you're doing this, you know, asking someone to come in and testify about their assets. And you actually fill the subpoena out. You get the court to enter it, and they give you a true copy. And then you have to have, this, have it served on the person that you have the judgment against. Uh, keep in mind that you cannot serve the judgment yourself if you're a party to the case that the subpoena arises from. And that it can't be an interested party. It's got to be a competent adult. Sometimes you can just have the court do it for you, process server. It's going to cost you a couple bucks, but, you know, it's probably worth it. And then you drag that person into court and make them testify about their assets. You can ask them where they work, where they bank, what assets they have, what things they own. You can sit there and poke at them and ask all these personal questions about where they've got their money, if they've got their money, or where they've got their assets. I can tell you right now that I brought somebody in for one of these exams and asked them where all, their, you know, where all the banks were and what their bank account numbers were. 
and then the next day issued a bunch of garnishments on those banks to get the money. You know, that's one thing you can do. If you find out where somebody works, you can garnish their wages. And again, you get a form from the court to, you know, form for garnishment and you, you, you get it entered with the court. You send it to the employer. The employer then files a report back as to how much this person makes. And then they can take a percentage out and you'll, you'll get these periodic payments. Um, you can also uh, subpoena and, and, and actually uh, seize their um, uh, tax returns. If they actually get money back from their tax returns, there's another form you can do for that. So that's actually, uh, you know, another standardized thing you can do. So one of the things I, I have to let people know is that if you think you're judgment proof, if you're sitting there listening to me going, Steve, I'm judgment proof, okay? I, I don't put money in the bank. I've got it all in a shoebox underneath my bed. If you ask me about it, I'll deny that it's there, so you'll never know it's there. Uh, and um, I, I work for a guy who pays me cash, and, and if you ask him if I work there, he'll deny it. And um, I make so little money that I don't get money back from the feds. Uh, and I'm basically off the grid. How can you, you know, what can you possibly do? Well, one of the things that you can do is you can um, drag the person for creditor's exam, find out where they live, ask them about stuff they own, and then you can get a writ of execution on their property. <laughs> and a writ of execution on property is, again, a document you fill out and you take it to court, and the court enters it and signs it. And then you get the writ, you give it to a court officer or a sheriff's deputy who's licensed and authorized and bonded to do these things. And I've done this before. I've done this many times. And in fact, um, I've had a couple defendants who just absolutely refused to pay any money. And so I, I get the writ of execution and I sick a court officer on him. And I actually got to know one of the court officers very, very well who did a bunch of these for me. And uh, his name is Vic. And I remember sending the paperwork over to Vic. And about a week later, he calls me and he goes, Hey, Steve, I'm standing on this guy's front porch right now. And he's crying. Do you want to talk to him? <laughs> And I go, sure, do you think it'll help? Next thing I know, a guy gets on the phone and goes, hey, uh, Mr. Leto, uh, there's a uh, <clears throat> court officer here who's threatening to take my car. And, and I've got a couple cars and he's threatening to take one of them. And how do I make him go away? And I said, well, can you give him the money for the judgment instead of giving him your car? And he goes, well, if I can go to the bank, yes. So I go hand the phone back to Vic. So they hand the phone back to Vic. Vic goes, what's going on? I go, he's going to go with you to the bank and cut you a, 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 some kind of cashier's check or money order or something that's good instead of letting you take his car. And Vic goes, okay, cool. You know, that's it. So the point is that if the court officer shows up at your place and says, I've got a writ of execution against your property, you're allowed to uh, exempt some of your property from execution, but not all of it. And if you've got a bunch of stuff, uh, the court officer can haul it all off. And what he does, he hauls it off, he auctions it, and then he takes the money from the auction to pay himself and then to pay towards the you know, reducing of the debt and the judgment. And the bad news for you is that when something gets seized in that kind of an auction uh, setting and gets taken to an auction and sold, that's the worst kind of auction of your stuff sold at because people go, well, let's see, the stuff was seized by a court officer. We don't know if it runs. We don't know if the clean titles. We don't know anything about it. So you're going to get literally pennies in the dollar. And um, I actually had a business, I'll just say, in Detroit that was obstinate, meaning that they refused, they refused to respect the fact that I had a judgment against them. And I contacted their attorney, and their attorney goes, my client doesn't want to pay. And I go, well, you understand what a judgment is, right? I mean, you're an attorney, right? He goes, my client's not going to pay this. And I said, well, you know, I don't know if that was their bargaining position, like, you know, hoping that I come back and say, well, we'll take less. Um, but I, I said, well, you know, if it's going to get ugly, it's going to get ugly. But I, you know, I'd rather have you just cut me a check. And the guy goes, well, I don't, I don't know, you know, what you think you can do, but knock yourself out. Well, the funny thing about it is, is that post-judgment actions don't involve the same notices that pre-judgment actions do. So if I'm involved in a lawsuit with you and your opposing counsel, and the case is going along. Every time I file something to the court, i got to file a copy with you. So you know what's happening with the court case. But when I file a writ of execution with the court, I just serve a copy on the defendant. And usually the guy who serves it is my <laughs> court officer who's also executing on it. And I've actually had my guy call me up and say, Hey, Steve, I'm going to go execute in that judgment tomorrow. And I say, Okay. And I, and I just stay by the phone and wait for the inevitable phone call. And I almost always get a phone call from a defense attorney. And I remember in the particular case I'm thinking of, the guy calls me up screaming at me, going, I can't believe you're executing on a judgment. I said, well, you're the one who told me your client wasn't going to pay. And he goes, well, yeah, I know, but that's negotiation. Let's, let's, let's 
you know, let's negotiate. And I said, well, you know, it's a little too late now because my guy's at your guy's place, apparently executing right now, hauling off stuff. And my court officer brought a U-Haul and was emptying all the equipment out of this guy's shop. And my guy is free, you know, my, my opposing counsel is freaking out going, but my guy's going to be out of business. And I said, that's not my problem, I don't think. And see, here's the thing. It's always better if people cooperate with you. Someone calls you and goes, look, I owe you the money. I'd like to work something out. Can we work something out? The court actually allows most individual defendants to go into court and get a payment plan to protect them from the person who's got the judgment against them. So if you get a judgment against an individual, okay, and, 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 and you're thinking to yourself, should I execute on their stuff or, or you know, one thing you can do is go, look, are you willing to make payments? Just something to indicate that you plan on paying this. Because if, 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 if you just ignore the judgment, eh, you know, 10 years from now, it will expire if you don't renew it. So you want to take steps and action on this thing. And so if you, if you ask somebody, are you willing to make payments? If they're willing to make payments, let them make payments, you know. And, 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 and if they make payments and they're making substantial payments, it makes sense. And I've seen that happen a lot of times where somebody says, hey, look, you know, I can't pay you the 10000 now, but I can pay you, you know, 500 bucks a month until I'm paid off. Interest is running on that. If you want to do it, and you know, if you think that's the best way to get the money, do it. You know, but like I said, when 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 the attorney calls me from the defense, uh, you know, on, on behalf of his client whose stuff is being hauled into U-Hauls right now, I don't have a lot of sympathy, and I just say, well, you know, uh, can you guys cut a check right now for the full amount of the judgment? They go, no, and I go, well, what what could you come up with? And I always, you know, I've had attorneys go, well, will you stop your guy while we're negotiating? And go, no. <laughs> It's one of the best negotiating tools I can possibly have. I've got a sheriff's deputy at your guy's place of business hauling out all of his equipment. It's going to put him out of business. Maybe this will motivate him to pay me. You know, who knows? And, I, and, I've, and I've had that happen more than once. Um, so, you know, like I said, you can execute on their property. Uh, you can garnish their wages. You can uh, garnish their uh, tax returns. Uh, and all of these things can be done, and there's a variety of court forms you can get on this. The cool thing is that all these court forms are online now, at least in Michigan they are. Um, I've heard from people in other states, there's a couple states out there that don't have their laws online and don't have their legal forms online, and that's a very sad situation because I think nowadays with the internet, it's so easy for a state to put all that stuff online, put the laws online so you can read them, put all the forms online so you can fill them out yourself, and... Um, you know, whenever I go to print out a form, I used to have a disk that had all the forms on it. I'd actually load the disk into my computer and download the form. And nowadays, I, it, it's it's faster for me just to search it online and pull it up and fill it out on my screen. It's in, you know, um, so <laughs> that's that's what you do. But all of this stuff is pretty straightforward. But the key is the key is that there are ways that you can get this money, uh, and you can get someone to pay you. And if somebody, and again, like I said, I know I'm going to get a couple comments from people saying, Steve, I'm judgment proof. And I'm planning on being judgment proof for the next 10 years. Well, it's kind of like a cockroach bragging about its longevity, okay? And cockroaches apparently can withstand many, many things. But I don't know why I'd want to live the life of a cockroach. And so the question is, the life you live as a person who is judgment proof means that you can't use bank accounts, you can't have a regular job, um, you can't get tax you know, refunds, and you can't have any assets of any real value because any assets you acquire, you know, things, you know, we can execute on those things. And every now and then you hear a funny story and, and, and the one I'll tell you, and I won't get too greatly into details because there's so much of it is online, but there was a Tigers pitcher for the Detroit Tigers uh, named Denny McLean. He's the last pitcher to win 31 games in a year. Uh, and in his prime, he was just insanely good. And unfortunately, after he got out of baseball, he fell on uh, hard times. And by that, I mean with legal problems. He spent some time in prison, ran into all, all kinds of bad business dealings, and he wound up getting sued a bunch of times. And I remember seeing an article in the paper not too long ago where people were out there at his house executing against his property because somebody got a judgment against him that he hadn't made good at that moment in time. So go online, look that stuff up. I'm not making it up. And every now and then you hear about these stories where, where somebody, you know, didn't pay a judgment or they didn't keep track of a judgment. Next thing you know, the sheriff's deputy showing up going, we're here to take your stuff. So you have to be aggressive. If you wait for someone to pay you, they might think you're going to go away. 
10 years down the road, you may have to go away if the judgment expires. Now, like I said, you can renew it, but again, you should take action on it. And I've discovered that when somebody gets a judgment against them, you got to wait for 21 days, usually the period, uh, the, the appeals period, you've got to let that run to make sure you're not going to appeal it. But after 21 days, when you start executing that stuff, I say on day 22, go after them. Let them know that you're not going to just roll over and wait for them to throw money at you. And, you know, it's interesting. I'll, I'll give you one last life lesson here. I served a guy with a subpoena to show up for a creditor's exam. And the creditor's exam in that particular court had to be conducted at the courthouse. So I went to the courthouse, checked in with my client, and the subject of the creditor's exam who had the judgment against him never showed up. And the judge calls the case, and I stand up and go, Your Honor, I'm here, but the guy who owes the money isn't here. The judge goes, okay, I'll issue a bench warrant for his arrest. And so a bench warrant got issued for the man's arrest because he didn't show up for court. And that thing to show up says, you know, it's an actual court order to show up. And on a Friday afternoon, about four o'clock, about three weeks later, I got a phone call from a court clerk who goes, Steve, uh, your guy identified in that subpoena just got pulled over for a routine traffic violation. And when they ran his license, they found the outstanding bench warrant from our court and he got arrested on it. He's sitting in jail right now. And I said, okay. And she said, do you want to take his creditor's exam? And I said, of course I do. And she goes, okay, well, the earliest we can get to him is Monday. How does Monday sound for you? And I said, Monday sounds good for me. And she goes, okay. The guy sat in jail Friday night, all day Saturday, all day Sunday, and a couple hours on Monday. They brought him to the courthouse. I took his exam. Then he left. <laughs> guy spent three days in jail. Now, he didn't spend three days in jail because he owed money. He spent three days in jail because he ignored a court order. But I realized that many people are going, what's the difference? Well, that's what happens. And in case you're curious, during that exam, I found out where he worked. I dropped the uh, thing on his employer and said, how much money does the guy make? And there's a formula. And I started getting checks periodically. Every time that guy got a paycheck, we got a check. Do the math, subtract it out, boom, boom, boom. It was an accounting mess. But we got our money eventually. But like I said, some guy spent three days in jail. So the key is to be aggressive. You can do this stuff. And if you're confused, you can actually go online. In fact, if you're in Michigan, type in how to collect on your judgment and you'll get a state pamphlet on it where it says collecting your money from a small claims judgment. But it's the same thing, small claims, regular, whatever. You've got a judgment against somebody. There's steps you can go through to collect. They're all laid out there. The forms are all laid out there. And this can be done without an attorney. Um, whether you should or not, yeah, you know, I, I, you can often call an attorney and get a couple questions answered for you quickly. I walk through people, people who's all the time, but it's it's fairly easy to do. But you've got to be aggressive and you got to do it. So that's how you collect money on a judgment. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Bye bye.